Equipping the Church to Evangelize in the 21st Century. In this series, Minister James Sanderson will be giving a biblical study on the fundamentals of the faith. So as a believer in Jesus, you can be better equipped to win people to Christ and keep them in Christ. Open up your Bible with us as we evangelize in the 21st century. Hello friends, it's good to be back with you again as we uh, discuss the subject of evangelism. I hope you're uh, enjoying these studies and uh, uh, I hope it's been helpful for, for you to try to lead your friends and family uh, to Christ. We are in study number four today and we are looking at chapter two in our workbooks and I hope you've got your workbook with you, Saving Souls in the 21st Century. Uh, this is going to help, help you to, to use as a tool to lead somebody to Christ. But we are on page 35 and we are in chapter 2, Leading Someone to Christ. So let's uh, look, open up our workbooks here to page 35. And uh, before we get started, though, uh, who do we have with us today? Guillermo Espinosa. All right, Guillermo, uh, I'm so glad you're, you're with us today. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, I hope we're, we're learning a lot. That's great. Yes. That's that's great. Um, I love to teach. Yeah. I love to teach, and every time I teach, I'm learning more too. So um, I need all the help I can get. Oh yeah. Well, we've went so far. We've went through the sin problem. Yeah. Sin does what with with God? It separates us. Separates us from God. Okay. Then we looked at the sin solution, and that's a grace faith system. Yeah. So when there's grace on the scene, when there's faith on the scene, that's where salvation from our sins, salvation, deliverance from God's wrath, okay? Yeah. But then in the next study we got into, the last study was on covenant and understanding that our faith must go in line with covenant. When God makes covenant with us, that should dictate what our faith is. And covenants change throughout the Bible. But what we've seen last, in our last study is, is how serious covenant is. If you're not in covenant with God, there's nothing that binds Him to forgive you. There's nothing that binds, binds Him to forgive me. And so we need to be in a covenant relationship with God. And we really haven't seen where exactly we get into covenant yet. But hopefully we'll, we'll discuss that in this study, okay? Because yep. that's real important. All right, we want to make sure that we don't show up on Judgment Day uh, outside of God's covenant, okay? Yep. All right, so let's, uh, let's look at this. this on, again, we're on page 35. When we first open the Bible, we soon discover that the Bible is split into two different parts. You've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. In our last study, we saw how the word testament can also mean a covenant, an agreement, or imply a contract in a sense. Since we're trying to please God with an obedient, with an obedient faith, we must know what that obedience is based on. If we do not properly understand which covenant or testament we're under, then it will cause us so much confusion in our spiritual lives. I mean, could you imagine that, Bill? If here I am opening up this Bible and I'm reading things back here in the Old Covenant, I'm trying to do these things to please God. Come to find out, that wasn't the covenant I was under. Yeah. <laughs> I, need to, I need to know which covenant I'm under so I can know how to please God, right? right. And, that, and I'll, I'll tell you what, in our religious world, so many religions, they pull off of different covenants, and it just makes a mess of, of their, their religious faith and their beliefs. Oh, yeah. So we're going to try to put some sense to this, all right? Yep. Okay. So in this study, we're going to examine the Old and New Covenants and see why the Old Covenant was incomplete for saving man, sinful man, and how the coming of Jesus in the New Covenant will set things in order. We will also see the differences between the two and the conditions we must meet under the New Covenant. So this is a big study. So we got a lot of ground to cover here. All right. Um, this is the book of Hebrews. It's in, it's in um, the New Testament. Bill, would you read uh, Hebrews 7, or chapter 8, 7 and 8 here, please? For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said... All right. So, apparently there's a problem here. Okay. As we saw in our last study, covenant is a binding agreement. When God made covenant with the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, this was a different covenant, okay, 
they entered into agreement, uh, and this is the promise or commitment they made with God. Now, as soon as Moses comes and reads them the covenant, look what they say here in Exodus. What does Exodus 24, 7 say? Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They respond, responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. All right, so here's the contract. People say, we're going to keep it. All right, now watch what happens. Unfortunately, as you follow the Old Testament, Bill, you're going to see uh, that the God's children individually and as a nation broke God's covenant again and again. All right? God's law demands perfection. Um, therefore, the only promise for man under this old covenant system was death. All right? You keep the law or you die. Hmm. That's pretty tough, isn't yeah. it? Okay? That's how it was set up. And since we've all sinned, Romans 3.23, it would be impossible possible for any of us to survive under that kind of agreement or a covenant. Okay? Because of this... God knew there there to be a need for another covenant. <clears throat> a covenant that satisfies both God's requirements of keeping his laws perfectly and meets man is in his imperfection of falling short of keeping them. That's really important. Super important. <clears throat> That's what the New Testament's going to do. The new covenant is going to do. <coughs> Excuse me. It's going to fix that problem. All right. Bill, this is in the Old Testament, and it's really talking about the changeover of covenant. It's actually a prediction that is to come. Could you read Jeremiah 31, 31, and 32 for us, please, here on page 36? Behold, the days are coming, say the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judea, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they break, though thought I was a husband to, to them, saying the Lord. All right. So he says, I'm going to make a new covenant, right? Okay. Here in the book of Jeremiah, Old Testament, God informs Israel of a new covenant that he will make with them in the future. But notice, he also gives the reason for the need of a new covenant. It was because they broke it. Which in the next verses, um, which, which in these next verses, God will give us the cure to their problem, which will bring us to the new covenant. Okay, so here's the cure. Now all this is foretold in the, in the Old Testament. So God knew all this was going to happen. He had this all planned out before the beginning of time. He knew exactly what man was going to do and how God was going to come along and fix it for us. Look at these verses in Isaiah 42, 6 through 9. He says here, he says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. To open the eyes of the blind, to free captives from prison and release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare before they spring into being, I announce them to you. So God is saying here, there is going to be changes coming. And I'm announcing to them in the future here. This prophecy is actually of the coming Messiah, the Christ. This is the prophecy of Jesus. And when he comes, he will give freedom to the people. And how is he going to do that? He's going to, he's going to take the thing that enslaves us away. Sin. It's our unwillingness to perfectly keep God's commands. And this, again, is sin. It's missing the mark that God has established. So Jesus is sent to be a covenant for us, to get us out of that sin problem. Okay? Look here in uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. This is also Old Testament. Look at this prophecy that God is giving just before he ends out the Old Testament. What does it say here, Bill? And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, saith the Lord of our of hosts. So that's that's Jesus. 
Jesus is going to be the messenger of the covenant. It's a prediction. He's going to come. He's going to bring us a covenant or a new covenant to get us out of the problem that we're under, under the old covenant. And you see what was the problem? God said, here's my law. You keep it or you die. Pretty straightforward. That's pretty straightforward. It's a serious, serious problem, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. When the Bible comes along and says, everyone has sinned and violated my laws, how can you survive under that? Yeah. You sin, you die. There, I hope there's a, there's a way out of this. Because okay. if, that's, if, if that's all there is, we're in trouble. Yeah. Okay? So, when, the next question should be, when does a new covenant begin? Okay? Because we've got, we got to know when does the old end, when does the new begin? Okay? So let's, let's, let's talk about this. It's important to understand that the coming of the new covenant centers around Christ and His death on the cross. Important covenant keeping always involves blood for a covenant to be put in place. Alright? So let's jump over here to the page over here at 37. And this is out of Hebrews. <clears throat> now watch how he uses this word covenant. It's in chapter, chapter 9, verse 16. For where a covenant is, there must be of necessity the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is only valid only when men for a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. Okay? For every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law. This is on Mount Sinai. He took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet and wool of hyssop, sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God made, commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the, all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So whenever God makes an important covenant with man, there's always blood involved, okay? Uh, or sacrifice made. It's no different when Jesus institutes his new and final covenant at the cross. Okay? Mm -hmm. when, he, when he puts this into place, it can't be put in place until he dies. Okay? We're trying to find out where does the new covenant start. You can see this in Matthew. I don't know, Bill, if you've ever heard these verses read. You know, we take communion every Sunday, right? Yeah. Yep. Sometimes these verses will be read. Do you, do you want to read these verses? This is what Jesus says. Uh, this is just before he died. Verse 27. 27. And when he had taken a cup and give thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sin. So, see, he's, he's connecting blood and covenant. Okay? Alright. When we get down to Colossians here, uh, this also referring to Jesus, it says, Having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us, he nailed it, uh, he, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So the point is this. When Jesus comes and he dies, he is going to bring a new covenant. But it can't be put in place until he dies. All right? So all of these verses point to the death of Jesus as the starting point of the new covenant to begin the old covenant to end. All right? <clears throat> But, if we were to look closely at Hebrews chapter 9 again, we may see the beginning point of the new covenant, including the day of Pentecost, which is 51 days after the death of Jesus. So we're going to use that timeline here. Yes, it was put in place when Jesus died. But there may be, at the starting point, may, may be extended a little bit beyond the cross. Okay? Let me see if I can prove that. Here's a different version of Hebrews. At the top of the page, we read Hebrews 9.16. That was in the New American Standard updated version. I'm going to read those same verses in the NIV and see if you can't see the difference. You want to read this for us, uh, Bill? In the case of all a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. 
because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. All right, so let's turn the page here. We read two different versions of that. The NIV, NIV version of the Bible uses the word will, and the New King James version of the Bible uses the word testament in place of the word covenant. So one version says a will, another version says testament, another version says covenant, okay? When someone dies, there is a will and testament right after their death. Right. Okay? Yes. All right? That's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. So it usually tells of the wishes of the deceased. Yeah. Okay? Covenants of the Bible work the same way. Remember that a covenant always carries with it promises. So when God gives a covenant, there's going to be promises within that covenant. Okay? But, it, but with those promises, there must be conditions met before the promises be, can be gained. We see this today sometimes when, when people die. They'll leave behind their wealth, but before the recipients can receive the money, they must first meet some of the guidelines laid out by the deceased. Right? right? They might say, you know, I'm, I'm leaving all this money, but this person is only 15 years old. Well, I want to make sure this person goes to college first and, right. you know, and, and, and is, is uh, you know, a good upright citizen before I just give them all of this money. If I give it to them too young, they might just go blow it and get in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Okay. This same kind of process takes place with the New Covenant on the day of Pentecost. This was 51 days after the death of Jesus um, on the cross. Okay? This was, a, this was a, a, a Jewish feast that they kept. Okay? So, promises were made to the people in Acts 2, but conditions had to be met before the promise could take place. And you can look at a couple charts right here on the other page here, okay? The importance of the day of Pentecost and when the old and the new began. But I would call this, this is what I would call the reading of the will, all right? So Jesus dies, okay? But the will hasn't been read for 51 days after his death, okay? See if this doesn't sound, if Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, when the apostles come out, See if this doesn't sound like a will being read. Okay? Um, number one, confirmation of death. When my dad died, before anything could be distributed, we had to wait for a, a certificate of death. Okay? okay? All right? Now watch what the apostles say here. Acts chapter 2, verse 30, or 20, 23. What, what does it say here? This Jesus delivered up according to the def definite plan of for, for knowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of the lawless men. Okay, so what they're doing is they're proving, yes, Jesus died. And later on in this text, they'll say we were witnesses of that. So we seen, uh, we seen that he was dead. Okay? Yeah. All right? Okay? So death has been proven. That's the first thing you have to do before a will can be put in place. All right? Notice the next thing here. The next thing is, is conditions given. Again, before the recipients can, can receive the money or the promises, conditions have to be met, right? Yeah. Well, let's see in Acts chapter 2 if these apostles come out and give some conditions that must be met first. What does Acts 2, 37 through 39 say, Bill? When the people heard this, they were cut out to their heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, I underlined what the conditions were. Yep. Repent, Repent and be baptized. And be baptized. Okay, that's what you need to do. They ask, what must we do? Now the apostles are coming up. Tell them what they need to do. Repent and be baptized. All right. Now that's the conditions given. Well, if they keep these conditions, what's the promises that they get? Let's see if we can't catch that. What's, what do they get from the person who is deceased? Let's turn the page over here to page 40. 
Let's read these same verses again and see if you can't see the promises. Okay? Go ahead and read verse 38 again for us. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. The promise. What's the promise? The promise is, I've got two of them underlined there. Forgiveness of sins. Now, Bill, is that important? Oh, yeah. If you're going to get to heaven, do you have to get your sins forgiven? Yes. Right? Okay. And the gift of the Holy Spirit. And as we're going to see in a later study here, the gift of the Holy Spirit is God's indwelling of you and making you His child. Remember what sin does? Separates. Separates us from God. So if God says, hey, you're in the family, you're back in. Okay. Now those are two pretty good promises. Oh yeah. Sins went away, I'll make you part of the family. Okay? okay? Now, that doesn't mean they get the promises yet. There's one more thing that you have to do. You gotta meet the conditions, right? Yep. Okay, well let's let's see if, if that's what happened. Let's let's read verse 41 and see what they did with this. Those who accept his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. There you have it. See? So when the, when, the, when the new covenant was put into place, yes, Jesus had to die. So everything centers around his death. But the will, 51 days later, had to be read to the people and the conditions given so they knew what to do. Right? Yeah. So now we know the crossover from Old Covenant to New Covenant, right? Okay. It's right in that, that 51 day period there. Right. Which, guess what? We're under that today, right? Right, oh yeah. I mean, I know my grandkids think I'm really old, but I'm not that old. I, was, I didn't live before Jesus died, okay? <laughs> All right, so see how the day of Pentecost served as a way, as a will and a testament. All of us today now live under the conditions of the New Covenant or New Testament of Christ. And if we hope to gain the promises of forgiveness of sins, Gift of the Holy Spirit, God's sealing us as His own possession. That's what Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says. Then we must also meet the conditions under the new covenant, which is what? Repentance and being baptized. Pretty simple, isn't it? Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Now, let's really see where a person enters in the covenant under the new covenant. There's a spot where you cross over and this is where you enter in the covenant relationship. Okay? We know with the, with the people in the Old Testament, the males, when they were circumcised on the eighth day, they entered into covenant relationship with God. How does it work under the new covenant? Okay? I'm, you're asking this stuff, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I want to know. All right. Good. So good, I get good. into heaven. That's it. That's <laughs> it. All right. <clears throat> So now that we understand the conditions that, that must be met by the recipients of the blessings of the New Covenant, we must also see at what point do we cross over into the New Covenant. When the Apostle Peter read the conditions of the New Covenant to the people in Acts chapter 2, he told the people to be baptized. Baptism is where you bury the dead body of sin into death, into Christ's death. That's what Romans chapter 6 verse 3 says, okay, 3 and 4. At that moment, our sins are then washed away in the blood of Jesus. That's what Acts 22, 16 says. And we are sealed with His Spirit as God's own possession. Remember, they were, they were going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14 says. After this burial, we are then raised out of the watery grave to walk in newness of life. So what's happening is, is you... You are, you're taking this dead body. We're dead because of our sins. We're in our sins. You bury that dead body into Christ. And then you raise that person up to walk in newness of life. See, see, see if that's not what this says here in Romans 6, verses 2 through 4. Could you read that for us, Bill? We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism in the, into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. There it is. 
So therefore, baptism takes on the picture of a grave. Okay? Buried with Christ. Grave. Okay? Yeah. Where we bury the dead body. The water takes on a picture of washing or cleansing. Okay? And the raising, raising back up, pictures the dead body coming to life, born again, going in a new direction. Okay? Right. See that? Yeah. All right? So you're dead, you're buried, you're raised. All right? But... Let's say we change our direction, Bill. We get, we get baptized, and somewhere down the road after baptism, we go back on our promises. Remember, we have to keep our promises, okay, in covenant, okay? Living for self again and thus turning away from Jesus. The same water that symbolized a cleansing is now also symbolizing a drowning, okay? Um... The same water that symbolizes a cleansing is now symbolized in a drowning. Why? Because in a spiritual sense, we are falling back into death all over again. If that water represents a grave, right? Water can symbolize a cleansing. But if you don't come up out of that water, or you fall back into it, you're falling back into death. Yeah. That same water that cleansed you, now you're drowning in it, in a spiritual sense. Right, yeah. Do you see that? Yeah. It was like that with Noah's Ark. Uh, the Bible says that Noah's Ark, the, that God cleansed the earth, okay? Yeah. All right? And it says that Noah was saved through water. So this water, he was saved through water, but the same water that saved him also drowned a lot of people, okay? Yeah. All right? So you can take on a couple different uh, symbols there. So when we are baptized into Christ, we have death on both sides of us. The water, just like God did in Genesis 15. Remember the dead animals we saw in the last study? Yep. You got dead animals on both sides. Baptism, therefore, is where we enter into covenant relationship with God. And if we do not keep our obligation of the covenant, remaining faithful to Christ, God will hold us accountable and we will become spiritually dead all over again. Now we're going to discuss that commitment factor and the point of entering into covenant relationship in more depth in our next two studies. But you can see, can you see the symbolism there? Yeah. Okay? The dead, the buried, the raised, the water, cleansing, but it also can drown you. Okay? So if I, if I get baptized and I'm in the covenant relationship with God and now I'm raised to walk in newness of life and I'm going in a new direction but somewhere down the road I decide, you know what? I'm not going to live like this anymore. Right? I'm not going to keep my promises to God. It's almost like you're falling back into death. You're falling back into that grave and that same water that cleansed you can now, in a spiritual sense, you're going to drown in it. And it's all because you didn't keep your promises. All right? Let's look at some differences between the old and the new. Before we end the study, I believe it's important for us to understand some of the differences between old and new covenants. This will help us better understand how our salvation works. Now, Bill, we read a little bit of this before. This is in Jeremiah, okay? But there's differences between old covenant and new covenant. I want you to see the differences here. Verse 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Now we know this is to us today because it was quoted, the same verses are quoted in the book of Hebrews. So this applies to us. According to Ephesians chapter 3, we are, spiritually, we are Judah, we are Israel. Okay? All right? Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers the day I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. So we. How did they get into covenant relationship before? Right? They were basically born into it. Yeah. All right? God says, I'm going to make a new covenant, and it's not going to be the same as the old covenant. There's going to be differences. Right. Okay? All right? So in verse 33, he says, But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. And I'll write it on their hearts. Then he says, I'll be their God. Who's God? Or, 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 or I will be their God. Who is the they? The they are those who have been taught and those who have obeyed. I'll be their God. And then it says, and they shall be my people. You see how that works? Yeah. And here's the difference in verse 34, the two covenants. 
No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquities and their sins I will remember no more. So let's flip the page here. Let's go to that, that second paragraph on page 42. See, this is so important in understanding how our salvation works under the New Covenant. If I'm not taught from God's Word, I do not obey God based on His commands, then I cannot be in covenant relationship with God. John chapter 6, verse 44 and 45. If we had time, I'd, I'd take you back and read this, and Jesus is saying the same thing. Okay? Right. This is why it says that they will no longer teach their brother and their neighbor to know the Lord, because they will all... All know me. And we, we've already discussed that. Okay? So, now let's look at the promise. That the new covenant is founded on better promises than the old covenant was. Look at Jeremiah 31, 34. We just read this. I will forgive their iniquities and their sins I'll remember no more. Whose sins does God forgive and remember no more? Those that have been taught and those who have obeyed from the heart. I'll be their God, they'll be my people, and their sins are gone. Do you see how that works? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, God's given us a road map here and telling us how salvation is going to work. The old covenant was different. New covenant is, 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 has some changes to it, right? You can see the changes, and God's just giving us a road map. Yeah. Coming together, ain't it? Oh, yeah. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Hebrews 8, verse 6 says, But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator, and as superior to the old one, and it's found on better promises. Well, what was the promise under the Old Covenant? You sin, you die. Okay, what's, what's the promise under the New Covenant? You sin, Jesus died for you. Hey, I like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a way out, isn't there? Yeah. Okay? And then Hebrews 12, 24, it says, To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkling blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Cain killed Abel. Genesis chapter 4. Cain's, Abel's blood spoke something. My brother killed me, and I demand justice. It's God's law that he sinned. He's got to die. The blood of Jesus speaks a better promise than the blood of Abel. Right? The blood of Abel says, you sin, you got to die. The blood of Jesus again says, hey, you sinned, I died for you. It speaks a better word, a better promise. Yeah. Is it coming together? Yeah. All right, great. Covenant changes some things. We need to understand this. Uh, page 43, first paragraph, second paragraph. Another thing that is important to understand is that when, when covenant changes, there's lots of things that change with it, like things like worship, traditions, certain practices. They all change in the coming of the new covenant. This is why you will see so many differences in the way they did things in the Old Testament versus the things that we do in the New Testament. Here in the book of Hebrews, the writer will show us one of those changes dealing with our worship to God. Let me just read this here. Hebrews 8, 13 says, By calling, the, calling this covenant new, he's made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. Now what happened to those Old Testament worship practices? When the covenant changes, they are obsolete. Things change, don't they? Yeah. Okay? And again, Bill, when you're dealing with different people and different denominations and teachings, what they're going to do is you're going to see so many of them go back to that old covenant and grab some of those Old Testament concepts of worship, and they're going to bring them forward. And you're going to go, what are these doing over here? That was left behind. See, we need to know how to divide that word correctly. Right? right? Covenant changes things. Yeah. All right? Um, so this should tell us that when we transition from old covenant to new, that things of worship will change. The old practices will become obsolete. The new ones will take their place. Here's another one right here. Um, we're going to go down to Colossians 2. We're going to skip down to verse 16. It says, Therefore, let no one judge you by what you eat or drink. Under the Old Testament, there were certain things you couldn't eat or drink. Or with regard to a religious festival, they had certain festivals they kept. Day of Atonement, Passover, 
all these different festivals, so don't let anybody judge you on that, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day, these are a shadow of the things were to come. The reality, are, however, is found in Christ. So do you see that covenant changes things? Yeah. Yeah. You learning some stuff today? Oh, yeah. All right. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So let's read this bottom um, paragraph here. Page 43. Yet when you come to the New Covenant, we see many changes in the areas uh, take place for, for many good reasons. Many of those reasons have to do with Jesus coming to earth. Many of the practices that the Lord commands under the New Covenant would have made no sense under the Old Covenant because Jesus hadn't arrived yet. Now that he has arrived, we have things like the Lord's Supper, right? Okay. Let's go down a little bit farther. God also gives us an example on, on when to take this memorial feast on the day on the first day of the week Acts 20 verse 7 why the first day it's because the first day of the week has new meaning now Jesus arose from the grave on the first day of the week okay all right uh, the church started on the first day of the week the day of Pentecost the day of Pentecost always started on a Sunday it was always on a Sunday so it so the church was first established Acts 2 on a Sunday Okay, not, not a coincidence there. Another major change under the Old Covenant was that only the high priest from the tribe of Levite could access God behind the curtain of the Holy of Holies. They're the only ones that could get in. Now that Jesus has died, the curtain that separated man from God has been removed. Remember as soon as he died, that curtain tore from top to bottom? God's like saying, hey, you can come in now. You can all come in now. So, there's lots of changes and we could go through all of those, Bill, but there's, there's a lot there, and I hope you're starting to understand how this Bible works. Yeah. One last thing. Um, one last question that you might be having is this. If the Old Covenant could not produce a way out for sinful, sinful man, then did any of the people living under the Old Covenant make it to heaven? Now that's a good question. It's like, if there's no way out for them, how do they get to heaven? Well, we're going to use the book of Hebrews again. Uh, chapter 9, verse 15. Um, for this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised internal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set free from those sins committed under the first covenant. If the people under the first covenant live by faith, then they will access God's Jesus' payment for their sins at the cross and receive God's favor and forgiveness. Therefore, Jesus' sacrifice will cover them also. Remember, remember the Bible works on a grace-faith system. So whenever you have both grace and faith, there was faith in the Old Testament, right? There was also grace. Justification for sins is granted. But remember, the key to it all uh, is uh, took the coming of Jesus to complete the package, the covenant package. Church, I, I just think this is good to study with somebody so they have a good foundation before they get into Christianity and they know what's going on. So slow evangelism down a little bit. And, and let's do a good job of making disciples. Well, Bill, it was good to have you on again. I'm glad. And we come back next time? Oh, yeah. All right, great. All right, and we will see you next time.